there. And throughout my experience with him here, it has been an unbelievable pleasure. Every time he's contributed, it's been something I didn't know. So it's been exciting. Having said that, if he deviates, we are going to heckle and throw things and <laughs> keep it exciting. So oh, <laughs> thank you, Gene. My name is Gene Morfitt. By the grace of God and the power of this program, I am a recovered alcoholic. I was asked to uh, speak on discipleship, of which I know very little. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about something. A teacher asked us what our favorite animal was. I said fried chicken. <laughs> she said I wasn't funny, but she couldn't have been right. Everyone else in the class laughed. <laughs> my parents told me to always be truthful and honest, and I am. Fried chicken is my favorite animal. <laughs> I told my dad what happened, and he said my teacher was probably a member of PETA. <laughs> he said they love animals very much. I do too especially chicken, pork, and beef. <laughs> anyway, my teacher sent me to the principal's office. I told him what happened, and he laughed too. <laughs> then he told me not to do it again. The next day in class, my teacher asked me what my favorite animal was. I told her it was chicken. She asked me why just like she'd asked the other children, so I told her it was because you could make them into fried chicken. <laughs> <laughs> she sent me back to the principal's office again. He laughed and told me not to do it again. <clears throat> I don't understand. My parents taught me to be honest, but my teacher doesn't like it when I am. Today, my teacher asked me to tell her what famous person we admire most. I told her, Colonel Sanders. <laughs> Guess where I am now? <laughs> A lot of you guys are Facebook people, probably. And you know how when you see something on Facebook posted, you like it, maybe? You realize you're not the first person to see it? So I was uh, shopping, and I saw this card, and I really liked it, and so I don't know if you've ever seen this, so amuse me if you have, but it's a saying that I really like. It has to do with our, our time in history. Being around you makes me want to stop, make, excuse me, being around you makes me want to briefly stop compulsively checking all forms of digital communication. <laughs> Should I read it again? No? no? <laughs> <laughs> Sick? Being, being around you makes me want to briefly stop compulsively checking all forms of digital communication. <laughs> you know what that means, right? No. If you text who I'm talking, I only take it marginally personally. <laughs> I don't really watch quite often, but if you do this, then maybe I'll notice. <clears throat> anyway, so that's uh, Nathan, thank you for the work you did here this weekend. Yes. Really, really. Yeah. And uh, I think what's being now, you know, do you know that you were the legacy team? No. Wow. That's not cool. Yeah, the, new it's like the Boston <laughs> Red Sox, you're the legacy team. Yeah. yeah. You need to get t-shirts. T-shirts. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So cool, huh? Yeah. I think these guys who really saw the value in, in giving a weekend. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Seriously. Right. Yeah. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, watching my dad, watching these guys, knowing what I know, 
they have invested a lot personally, financially, in other ways. And it really, really is amazing. And uh, the, the last one I have on the list to thank is John Metcalf. Because it goes, he wants to clap already? I know you want to clap. She wants to clap. But about an hour, a year and a half ago, the conversation began. Wouldn't it be fun to have everybody go to a retreat? All the leaders of the other retreats so we could get to know each other. <clears throat> and that's how this thing evolved. And um, all the different iterations of, of what was desirable and what the location and all that stuff. And you should come up to Amy in October instead of down here in mm -hmm. February. But to you us, know, all part of it. But we we'll really want to thank John for being fastidious, persistent, and I mean, there he is back there working right now. Huh? <clears throat> I uh, wanted to look up a couple quotes. There was a quote I thought that was, should be, I thought Mark Twain made the quote, said the words. And so I summed all the way through these Mark Twain quotes to look for it. And I landed on this one. Never agree with stupid people. They will drag you down to their level and then beat you with experience. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the one I was looking for, but come on. I've been to both sides of that deal. <laughs> right? I've been the stupid person. And I've been the guy who thought he was going somewhere. But this is the one I wanted. People need to be reminded more often than they need to be instructed. Said another way, the old way, men more often need to be reminded than instructed. And I think tonight I'm just going to take a few minutes, and, and probably for most all of us, it's just it's going to be reminders. Things that probably almost everybody has heard, but I get the privilege of sharing them, and um, and I really, I really do look forward to this. It's going to be fun. If there's a place in the big book that has really captured my attention, it's, it's these two paragraphs. If I could read them. <clears throat> On the third day, the lawyer, the lawyer gave his life to the care and direction of his creator. Yeah. And he said he was perfectly willing to do anything necessary. His wife came, scarcely daring to be hopeful. Though... She thought she saw something different about her husband already. He had begun to have a spiritual experience. That afternoon, he put on his clothes and walked from the hospital a free man. He entered a political campaign making speeches, frequenting men's gatherings, gathering places of all sorts, often staying up all night. He lost the race by a narrow margin, but he had found God. And in finding God, he found himself. And so, with the idea of discipleship, there's, there's one thing that I'm holding on to tonight, and that is that the most core basic element of discipleship is that a person and God contribute to another person finding their destiny. God, another person, and the third person finding their destiny. Beyond discipleship, I really don't know a whole lot of wordage to use, but I have found uh, a couple pieces, and so I want to share with you, for me, how I go about life and affecting the lives of others. Some of it I do intentionally, some of it evolves, but part of it is, somebody read it somewhere along the line, I believe it was Jack, who said, always be ready. Always be ready. So we gather in all the things that we can so that we're always ready. So I'm going to share uh, some of the concepts I've learned, two life experiences and, and a vision I'm carrying. First concept is Coach Mike McCarthy. Everybody know Mike McCarthy? Yeah. yeah. Wow, that was really quiet. <laughs> yeah. Green Bay Packers head coach, yeah. come on! Oh, all right. Woo! Hey. 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 Distant admirer? <laughs> okay. I'm going to stay in the blue. We're not in Wisconsin anymore. 
the first concept Coach Mike McCarthy used. You can't assign leadership. It is my job to create opportunities for leadership. It has worked out well. One of the reasons that we have Second Saturdays is to help people begin to develop their leadership skills. Speaking skills, leadership, contributing. And uh, we had Second Saturdays for a place for people who we think might be good retreat speakers to speak in a really uh, safe environment where everybody there was pulling for them. There was, the people have already been through the retreat, right? Yeah. And so everybody there knows that it's key important for us to support our up and coming stars, if you will. The folks that are really trying to stretch themselves and become who it is that God designed them to be. So it's one thing with our second Saturdays. It really is another thing to begin to let people contribute work wherever they can. <clears throat> Another uh, concept that I carry is every person has a propensity for greatness. Every person in this room is amazing. And everybody is wired to be amazing, <clears throat> to do amazing things, to live an amazing life. I believe that for everybody. I started out not believing that. I didn't understand God. Because God believes that we're amazing. One thing I know for certain, if, if everything else was washed away, I know that he's crazy for me. That has got into the very core of my being that God is absolutely crazy for me. You guys maybe too, but I'm his favorite. <laughs> he really loves me. <laughs> we stand shoulder to shoulder, Dale. <laughs> Clarence said we are the cream of the crop. That we carry some very unique talents. The struggles that we've been through, the talents that we carry, have inside of us the capacity to do amazing things, to be amazing people, to really revolutionize this world. And one of the things that I try to watch for as I'm working with people is when they came into our environment, found the freedom that we found, is, is their primary, I hate to use this word, church world, their place of destiny about us? Or did God bring them out of this trouble because their major contribution might be somewhere else? While we want everybody, right? We want everybody. I really have to accept the fact that not everybody's primary place of, of uh, bringing value to this world necessarily has to be in our environment. Yeah. I have to be willing to accept that. That I can congratulate and pour myself into another life without holding any notion that they're going to be mine. Right? Right? There cannot be any sense that I am doing this because it's going to enhance something about what I'm doing. Yeah. All I get is the satisfaction of seeing the changed life. Yeah. Whatever goes beyond that, that's, that's with them and God. And we want everybody. Mm -hmm. We want everybody. <clears throat> Another concept that has shaped the way I think about things is something I learned in business school. My teacher was a executive at Procter & Gamble, and if you follow some of these things, Procter & Gamble has always been ranked one of the highest rated places to work for. And this is their management mentality. They believe that everybody, given the opportunity, wants, not will, wants to do their very best. That everybody wants to do their best. And you know, for me, I, in my early years, I just wanted to get along. I was hurting on the inside a bit because I didn't have the capability of doing better. But now that I'm in relationship with God especially, I want to do my best. 
I want to be about excellence. I want to steward this heart that God has gave me to be better every day. And I believe that other people do too. And so when I'm working with people, I carry these thoughts that, yes, they do want to do the best they can. And if I'm able to at all facilitate that, they're going to get the pleasure of doing it, and I'm going to get the pleasure of being part of it. When Jesus, this is another concept, when Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, I believe he was enticing them. When Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men, it was not an unknown concept of having people follow. Yeah. I mean, we, we see people who like to have other people follow them, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen people who love to sponsor 20 people because it's like they're known for having this big corral of yeah. people. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> And so, when Jesus said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men, I believe he touched a button that has ego as part of it. And that their thing was, wow, I'm going to get a place of prestige. Because there are going to be people who are interested in me and follow me around because I'm following him around. Right? Are you with me? And I think we have to be ever willing to... To not worry about people's egos. That when issues come up where ego's involved and we have a sense that there's ego involved, this is our chance to be the leader. Many of us, including me myself, I know primarily, have always wanted to shy away from that. That when people are disruptive or, or you just have a sense that whatever they want to do, they want to do about themselves and and you push the button a little bit and it becomes frantic or angry or lying or any of these kinds of things, that doesn't mean it's time for me just to dismiss them. It means that it's time for me to do what I can to bring them to their place of destiny, right? Call the disciple or to lead. <coughs> And uh, one, more, one more concept I want to talk about, and I'm going to move on to a couple of things. But that is that God has wired within us the need for satisfaction and the hunger for reward. A Bible verse in particular is, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Yes. Well, if God wasn't about satisfaction, why would he be talking about the desires of our heart? Mm -hmm. Didn't God, after every page of creation, say, that's good. <laughs> that's good. And then us crazy nuts, he said, this is real good. <laughs> it's real good. I have to believe that when God said it's good and it's real good, that he was satisfied. That he was satisfied, and if we're made in his image, if we're made like him, that that thing of having satisfaction is an important deal. <clears throat> I, I said earlier in one of the little spots that um, there, nothing rocks like helping somebody else find the, find the freedom that I found. That gives me a great deal of satisfaction. The second thing on the reward is, there's this pesky Bible verse that says, And without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Yeah. That God rewards us when we're on this pilgrimage. That he rewards us. That he puts rewards in the pathway. It doesn't say the reward is I get to go to heaven when I die. It says the reward is there for the seekers who are living. 
And so I believe that it's a, uh, it's a big deal to God, uh, satisfaction and rewards. I want to touch on one more thing, um, and then let me give you a bit of my story. We were talking uh, this weekend about making first impressions, what people see. I don't know if you, any of you guys know a person, an author named Malcolm Gladwell. Great books. Tipping Point, Blank, Dave and Goliath, several books. Well, I downloaded one after we talked because I knew this point was in here and I wanted to get to it. But there's a place in, in our brain, in our being, it's called adaptive unconscious. And that place is that we store things to be used later on the spur of the moment. For instance, crossing the street and there's a car coming, you've stored enough knowledge to go bing out of the way, right? <clears throat> the, the part of our brain that leaps to conclusions like this is called the adaptive unconscious. In the field of study of this kind of decision making is one of the most important fields in psychology. The reason I bring this up is in our leadership and discipling, I think it's important to trust our hunches. Especially if we've started building up a history of seeing when a hunch appears and we move on it, what the outcome is. When we can test our heart to say, okay, I saw that, I think that, Am I in the right place to judge like that? Am I in the right place to make that kind of determination? This is a really fascinating story. Whenever we meet someone for the first time, whenever we interview someone for a job, whenever we react to a new idea, whenever we're faced with, a, with making a decision quickly and under stress, we use that second part of our brain, the adaptive unconscious. How long... For example, did it take you, when you were in college, school, the retreat, seeing Nathan, to decide how good a teacher your professor was? <laughs> a class, two classes, a semester. The psychologist, I can't say her name, once gave students three 10-second videotapes of a teacher with the sound muted off. So a silent movie, right? Wow. Of a teacher. And found they had no difficulty at all coming up with a rating of the teacher's effectiveness. Huh. Ten seconds, they look at a video of somebody teaching, no sound. <clears throat> Let's see. They found they had no difficulty at all coming up with a rating of the teacher's effectiveness. Then, she cut the clips back to five seconds, and the ratings were the same. They were remarkably consistent, even when she showed the students just two seconds of videotape. Then, she compared those snap judgments of teacher effectiveness with evaluations of those same professors made by their students after a full semester of classes, and she found that they were also essentially the same. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Why am I bringing this up right now? Because the first time I saw Sharon Christensen at our retreat, I said, there's somebody who has a professional image, somebody who takes really good care of themselves, and somebody who brings value to what it is we're doing. I saw that that fast. Fortunately, you're that way. <laughs> Right? Anybody who got to meet her? Yeah. Yeah. I met Sean Higgins at church. First thing I saw, the first, the moment words came out of his mouth, I said, this guy's a strong leader. And this guy knows where he wants to go. Now, you were only, what, two months sober at the time? Yeah. <coughs> I didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> 
that was my that was my initial hunch, and uh, I trusted it. And we've been developing it ever since. Now, just because the hunch works out in the beginning doesn't mean there's not going to be testings along the way, right? Because that's just the people that we are. But I think it's important that we, one, trust our hunches, and two, even if we feel like we've got off on the wrong step, that we continue to pour in love and compassion, concern, whatever it is to offset how we might have initially harmed somebody. Because even though that hunch was probably accurate that that other person had of us, don't you think love changes an attitude? Mm -hmm. yeah. It absolutely does. So while I want to be, I mean, I went and bought a new shirt because of Liz's talk. You like that? Mm. Oh, yeah. Huh? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. Pretty good, huh? Thank you, Liz. You expanded my wardrobe with your little talk this morning. <laughs> <laughs> it was just an excuse to spend money in home. <laughs> but anyway. Um, Okay, my two stories. Ten years old, my grandma persuaded my mom to let me go to a Baptist Bible camp. We weren't Baptists, but I guess mom thought it'd be a good deal or agreed with grandma. Grandma was the greatest person on the planet. No, for real. So, so mom let me go. I get to Baptist Bible camp, and uh, Friday night, campfire, we're talking about Jesus, I can feel his presence, I say yes. I mean, I don't even really know what I'm saying yes to other than it feels so stinking good. As soon as I said yes, I heard the words, you're called to be a minister. Now, for a 10-year-old boy, what do you do with something like that? We don't talk, and I was raised Lutheran, and in the Lutheran church that I was raised in, they never talked about calling, I never once heard the pastor say that he was called, we didn't ever talk about destiny or any of these kinds of, you know, things. So I didn't know what to do with that, except it was there. Went on about my life. I was 15. By now I was, uh, <laughs> as I told Dee, I was starting to get pretty naughty. <laughs> but I was still interested in God, and so I was invited to this thing uh, with my um, group from church, the kids who went to our confirmation class, it was right before we were confirmed, and it was the same kind of meeting, and the same kind of thing happened, and went back to my room, I could feel the presence of God really strong, and uh, in the room, it was probably as big from there to there, however, like the size of our rooms here, except there's room for double beds, but everything else was equally as tight, in the bed next to me are two of my, four of my Luther Lee, buddies, I mean, two girls and two guys, no, all buddies, making out. And I'm in the next bed over feeling the presence of God. So much so that all I can say is, yes, please, whatever, uh, come in. Oops, I went out of the blue, sorry, Kevin. <laughs> but again, I didn't have anybody to bounce that off of. I didn't know how to communicate with that. Oh. And so as soon as I said yes, did I say this already? I was so worried about the blue line I just got for you. <laughs> as soon as I said yes, I heard you're called to be a minister. Okay, so I don't know what to do with that, right? Go back. Nobody's talking about it, especially my high school buddies have been drinking beer and stuff. It's not something you, you know, how do you process that with those guys? And so... All the way into my using life then, I had a sensitivity toward God. And I could feel his presence even sometimes at the craziest junctures. 1981, our first retreat, Clarence Snyder said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And I never heard those words before. My ears never heard those words before. What was that <coughs> message? Heard is a message good or I'm sorry. You know what I mean? I never got that message before. I might have read the words. And, and uh, the other thing that Clarence said is that if you're trying to make yourself good enough, 
for God, hang it up. Just give your life to Him and He'll do all the making good that needs to be done. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I tried to go to sleep with those two thoughts in my head. But God was bothering me all night. All night. And uh, I began to realize He was bothering me about the in Christ part. So I, I, I went to find a Bible to try to show God that I could have Him without Jesus. And it's hard to do that in the New Testament. So I, I gave up on that. When I tried to go to sleep, He wouldn't let me. He just kept bothering me. I floated to Him all of my reservations about Christianity, what I saw, what I felt about it, why I wouldn't want to do that. And the whole time, it's like every time those reservations came up, they were washed away. There's the reason I'm telling you this story. It is going to get to a more major point. Um, he was still there. And somewhere about four in the morning, I realized it wasn't God in the room, that it was Jesus. And he was wooing me. None of you were there. I, none of you encouraged me to pray a sinner's prayer, no altar call, no nothing. God was calling me, loving me, already showing me that he's crazy from melting my heart. What, with an experience like that, as soon as I, here's how I started out this grand relationship, I give up. <laughs> it's, like the, it's like the girl who has to finally say that when this guy keeps calling over and over again for a date. <laughs> okay, I give up. I give up. As I'm rolling out of bed, I come into my life. I'll do whatever it takes to keep this moment alive. Please, I need Bible people. That was my prayer. As soon as I said I need Bible people, I heard, you're called to be a minister. Yeah. Now, dear is right. <clears throat> but now I have Bible people to talk about this calling thing to. <clears throat> and uh, so I, I go through that school, all this different stuff, go through a lot of different mm -hmm, highs and lows. And I get to a church, and I love the pastor's a good friend of mine, really good friend, a very dynamic person. We golf together. Um, he trusts me. It's just, it's just a really great relationship. And I'm fasting in the spring, and I hear God tell me, "You're going to be the pastor of the church." <coughs> but my friend's the pastor, right? So, I gather myself up, I go into church, and I say, you wouldn't believe this. Because I'm going to be open, right? I've got to be open about something like this. You won't believe this. He said, no, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. Well, who's first? Well, he was bigger than me. He got to go first. He was more dynamic than me. He won that, anything. But he said, I've just been called away from here. <coughs> Come on. Yeah. And I said, stink, you wouldn't believe this. But I've been fasting this last week, and I was up praying today, and God showed me that I'm supposed to be the pastor of the church. He said, this is amazing. That's the last thing he said. So, he's departing. I tell the church board this. They're not as excited as I am. <laughs> and then, I hadn't done a lot of this by then. And so, they said, well, I wonder who else we can consider. <laughs> so, I went along with them in their considering other people. And uh, we chose somebody. And when that somebody came, it was very destructive from our church. We went from 250 to 50. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm trying to process this through the whole time. I'm trying to believe that it's still God in there. And, you know, all this different stuff. And pressures are coming. And 
people are starting to do this, and I don't want to ever hear this, I don't like criticism. And well, one day, the uh, other two deacons and I were counting the money, offering. And the pastor made a really harsh, harsh remark over the speaker. And I turned to one of them and I said, did he just mean us? Yeah. I let something happen at that moment that I should have never let happen. I should have never took root of bitterness. I should have never allowed this, um, you know what I'm saying? Just because they said yes, just because something stirred inside of me that was negative. So, so I start fasting again. And I hear God tell me, you're going to be the pastor of this church. Whew. It looks like it's all systems go, right? This guy's a crumb bucket. I'm the mighty man of faith and power of the hour. I've been fasting twice, and God's told me twice you're called to this. So we went in there, and we commenced to tell that guy that he was done. And I was the guy. We didn't tell him I was the guy. That happened. <clears throat> and as you, as you might imagine, things didn't go well. I'm talking about this in the context of leadership and discipling because it really is important that we watch over each other and help each other process, especially things that when we're stepping into areas that we're unfamiliar with they're unfamiliar with. That there are certain principles that stand above personalities, even callings. The biggest lesson for me in that whole thing was when God told me the second time that I was called to be the pastor, I did not stop and say to God, and how's this going to work out? Because I really believed what I was hearing from God was really the truth. <laughs> The problem is I didn't continue the communication. I snapped off and went off with my own agenda then. Mm. And I want to tell you this as a, as a sort of failure, because it brought a lot of hurt to me, my family, the church. I, I, I resigned. I didn't, I didn't do anything that you find in the newspaper and gossip columns. It just didn't work out. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I resigned, and I resigned knowing that I stepped into a place that I wasn't orchestrated to because God hadn't given me the directions on how or how to approach it. You understand what I'm saying? Now I want to tell you a cool story. I mean, that was cool because it's a learning, a learning story, right? I mean, when I told that story to my class at Bethel College, you could a pin drop because I have to imagine you got church leaders who have all stepped into areas they're not supposed to. I say that to us in leadership or emerging leadership that we don't step into areas that we're not called to. I say that, that we should be doing whatever we do with excellence so that when the opportunity arises it's just apparently obvious to the whole wide world. You understand what I'm saying? So my second story deals with the retreats. <clears throat> I was birthed, if you will, at the I was birthed at the first retreat in Amory, 1981. I was telling you the story about Clarence and all that. And so, um, I grew up, if you will, with the retreats. And I let, we moved to Missouri for a few years, moved back, and uh, I think of the, I don't know, was it say on the flyer, 63rd or I probably have been the 58 of them, of just the Amory ones besides whatever it was. So I'm saying I've been very involved with that. So when, I, when we moved back, uh, Dad gave me this ministry of recording and videotape. I mean, it's pretty glamorous, right? That's just like... And uh, I told somebody, I was so committed to this thing, not just recording, I, you know, I'll do that as best I can. I'm not 
superstar. But this is where my heart was. If my dad would have told me to move that phone over here, and that's all I was to do at the retreat that year, I'd have been satisfied. Because now I've learned a lesson. Because this is this is this is happening while the church thing and then way past the church thing. Right? There's that one. That's all Dad would have wanted. I would have been satisfied with my responsibilities at the retreat that year. Because I'm teaching myself, now that I'd already, if we're going to do this right, if we're going to do anything at all anymore in this lifetime, in regards to this. So, about, I don't know, maybe 95, my dad <laughs> asked me, are you going to want to take over the retreats? And I think about then Dale started showing up with Tom, and then there was a couple other people from around Amory who, you know, really came in and assisted Dad and were tight, and I'd watch that, and I'd think, well, I don't know that I have to. Really, I don't know that I have to. Maybe. So whenever Dad would say to me, um, what do you think about taking over the retreats? I would say, are you sure it's supposed to be me? And he would never answer. <laughs> I mean, it's really reassuring, right? <laughs> But that's okay, I can live with some mystery, I can live with some intrigue, I can live with some evolution of whatever's supposed to happen. So I, I guess, I think I wrote down maybe five to eight times he asked me over a period of seven, eight years. So now comes January of 2007. My dad's racked with cancer. He's in the hospital, he's... He's uh, taking pain meds, and they, I mean, my dad's hurting bad. My dad physically had a, hurt a lot of his life, but he was hurting so stinking bad. And I came in one morning, I worked all night on the railroad, and I came in in the morning, and uh, he was just, <laughs> he was alert. He was perky. <laughs> and I thought, wow. He said to me, are you, are, you think you want to take over the retreats? To which I said, are you sure? To which he said, yes. And so when my dad said yes, I said yes. He said, okay, go home, uh, get some sleep, come back this afternoon, we'll have a pastor here. And uh, so I came back in the afternoon, Dad didn't take any pain meds all day. And he was still perky. And uh, so we visited a little bit, pastor was there, mom was there, my sister Joanne was there. And uh, we talked for a little bit. I can't, I can't even remember all what was said. But Dad said, are you ready now? And I said, yes. And I knelt down next to his chair, he laid his hands on me, and he released the responsibility of the Amory retreat to me. Now, he did me no favors. <laughs> <laughs> if you know what I mean. But on the other hand, it was the most amazing Amazing thing. It's a simple thing, but it's amazing. My pastor, who has seen some very miraculous things, says it's like in the top five things he was ever part of in his whole life. But to, but, but to get to see something done right is so important. That it's done right. That, that I didn't push, he didn't push. We just let it work itself out. And how often don't we do that? <coughs> so, after Dad prayed for me, he made some qualifying remarks, <laughs> the, 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 which was, make sure you stick to the principles that Clarence taught us. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, one side of me wanted to say, was thinking, why do you got to say that? I mean, don't you trust me? 
The other side of me was saying, it's really important to my dad. And if you can't receive something without there being a bit of pressure and tension, then you shouldn't be carrying anything to begin with. I mean, I have to imagine most of us in our lives, while we're trying to do the very best that we can, brush up against pressures and tensions. Seriously, we're thinking, I didn't bring this on, but it's just amazing that God trusts us. And he trusts us in our development, and he trusts us in assisting with the development of others. And that's a big thing. Yeah. That's a major leap thing. <clears throat> One time I did a flop -a rooney <laughs> The next time, it was heavenly. It, it was amazing. I say that all to say that you really can come into your place the right way. Every one of us have a destiny. Every one of us have a place with which our leadership, our amazingness, that stuff that's inside of us can, can bear fruit. We all have that place. Sometimes the process is the biggest deal. Sometimes it's the biggest deal. So I want to close with two things. I share a vision with the folks at our retreat. My vision is this, I want to have a retreat every month. Do you think I come up against a little pressure and tension when I make a statement like that? Ay, 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 are you nuts? <laughs> And I say, don't we have the best thing going on the planet? Mm -hmm. yes. Seriously, don't we have the best thing going on the planet? Yes. My second piece of that is that we have our own retreat center. It's my vision. It's the vision I share with the team. Sometimes they think I'm crazy. Yep. Sometimes they tag along with me. <laughs> See what happens. <laughs> My vision is to have a second Saturday every Saturday that we don't have a retreat. My vision is to see hundreds of amazing people in my region doing what it is that God's called them to do, and I'm going to be part of it. Why not? Don't we have the best thing going on the planet? Yeah. yeah. Is it big for me to think that I can be part of that? Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is big. God saved me from a big ego, but that is a big deal. The Bible says unless a kernel fall into the ground and die, it bears no fruit. So while I share those visions, I don't force them. I let them take root for themselves. I believe that we're going to have a retreat a month. I believe we're going to have 11 retreats like I described to you, and I believe we're going to have one retreat that's like the retreat I experienced first with Clarence where it's let down your hair day. It's going to be alumni retreat day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm good for seeing it evolve. I watch for those places where, okay, looks like it's starting to crop up here. Do we got enough folks? Mm, not yet. Okay. Back off, Gene. I could get this building over here. Okay. But if we have our own facility, we wouldn't have to be charging nearly so much. So it would be a lot easier for a lot more people to go. Okay, let's back off and watch this thing happen. Because if God has helped me, has helped birth this vision in me, I'm going to see it come true. But I'm not going to be afraid of the tensions that come up because I speak it out and I believe for it. Yeah. Come on, tension, do what you want to do. You haven't won yet. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You haven't won yet. I've heard people speak about tensions. 
And uh, I want to say that if you're going to be a retreat leader, you're going to have tensions. Yeah. Everybody who's a retreat leader or help retreat leaders understand? Yeah. You're going to have tensions. Yeah. Or help retreat leaders understand? Yeah. You're going to have tensions. You're going to have tensions. It comes with the territory. It comes with, 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 with developing us. It comes with refining us. But we have to, we have to carry it. The last, the last one I want to read is this verse. <coughs> he who receives you, receives me. And he who receives me, receives him who sent me. I'm absolutely convinced that Jesus has sent me. I'm absolutely convinced of it. There was a time I had to get over myself in that regard. But I think it's important to each one of us, if we're going to be about this, come to the place where we can say, if you receive me, you receive him. Because Dicea, I feel a little tension. I'm good with that. I think it's important that we can bear up under such a responsibility. We don't, we don't, we don't brag about it. We don't announce it on Friday night when you, hey, you all come here. You meet me, you met Jesus. Come on. <laughs> Just gonna have to square up with that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a great retreat, wouldn't it? <laughs> if we could just be so honest. No. <laughs> no, I think it's important that we can carry those kinds of truths with dignity, with an understanding that said, yeah, God. i got to pull up my big boy pants if I'm going to walk that thing out. If I'm going to believe that you receiving me, which means you're going to let me into your world, means that you're receiving him. I don't have to tell you that, but I telegraph it. Not in an arrogant way. In a way that says, he who is in me causes me to go to you, to bring him to you. Be a good time to close in prayer. Father, I thank you. I bless you for this amazing, amazing gathering. Father, I thank you for all, all of the um, um, difficulties and all of the financial, personal things that each person invested to be here this weekend because, because we care about what it is that's supposed to happen through Came to Believe Retreats. And I thank you, Lord, that this amazing cast of characters arrived here that we can be a blessing in these Came to Believe retreats. Father, I thank you that you have wired us to care, and you have wired us to carry out a commission in this environment. Help us to be ever mindful of what that is. To not take things for granted. That when we are having our time of prayer and meditation, finding out what your will for us is, that we linger long enough to find out if we heard the whole story that day. Help us not to operate under assumptions, but do what we do with excellence and patience. In Jesus' name. Yaman. Thank you, everybody. Real quick. Mike asked. Oh, yeah.